This meeting is being recorded. Did everybody give their permission to be recorded? They will, they'll get, they'll all have to give consent when they okay. enter, which is good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. I need to tap to continue. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can see the chat room? Say again? Someone ask something? No, I just wanted to make sure that we could all see the chat room if somebody. Oh, yeah. Asks. Or, or everybody knows how to get to the chat room. You just press that button chat on the bottom. And then if you want to see all the participants. Oh. Welcome people who are entering. We will begin at two o'clock. They finished the third ballot yet, Gail? Working on it. Okay. I'm trying to, I'm leaving the screen up behind this screen. Yeah. So enough so I can see um, they're actually using the big screen so I can kind of see what's going on. So we'll see. If I know, I'll kind of, I'll send you a, I'll chat. I'll let Sounds you good. Know. Gail's, Gail's watching the live stream of the North Dakota Bishop's election. Me Megan and I are being voyeurs, or at least I'm still being a voyeur. I'm yes. watching their um, live stream Synod Assembly Bishop election. Oh, Which Synod is this, Gail? Western North Dakota. And they are, um, and they are uh, electing a new bishop because there's an interim there right now. So, um, and who, who are the top three now? Do you know? I don't know. That's what I'm waiting for. Oh, I so, see. Um, but there was one, one of the seven who is a graduate from PLTS. Oh, I see. Yeah, I was like, wait, go, go PLTS. Yeah, woo! <laughs> go Do you know the name? Do you know um, the name? Schweitzer. Uh, I can't remember his first name. But oh, his last Greg Schweitzer? Yes. And yes. Just, just, just to give you a little bit of, you know, yeah, he was reality a TV, he's the top vote getter so mm -hmm. far. Yeah, he was a team student. Okay. Wow. Oh, I'm really proud. He was. Yeah, nice. and he <laughs> spoke very well. I was very impressed with his good, that's five, minute, five minute little speech he did. So I was like, okay, good. So. He's a good guitarist. He plays oh, he? the nice. church wide events. Okay, well, good. Those who are joining us will begin in about one minute. One minute to countdown. Okay, you're making me nervous now. <laughs> It'll be okay. I will take my video down while Bill is leading, but I'll still be here rooting for you. Right. All right. Yeah, and everybody just be yourselves and say whatever's on your hearts and minds and and, and, and trust that. Trust that. I mean, besides, the Holy Spirit is here, so why worry? <laughs> <laughs> Or, or I can also say being nervous is part of it. So just handle the energy or enjoy the moment or laugh about it. You know? Or <laughs> it, it could become a story you can tell your children or your grandchildren or anyway. Or you could say, I survived an actual Zoom <laughs> webinar and God didn't strike me dead. <laughs> and I can't think of any better words to start us off than that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Welcome everyone to our town hall that prioritizes voices of intersectional Lutherans. I'm Pastor Megan Rohr and I'll be sharing some information about logistics at the beginning of our meeting and collecting Q&A questions from those who are joining us on Zoom and anyone using hashtag Lutherans Listen on social media. Uh, you will notice if you are in the Zoom that you do not have video or microphone access. We're reserving that for panelists in order to help kind of focus our hearts and our minds as we listen to voices tonight. This choice also decreases the likelihood that this Zoom space will be intentionally disruptive by others. Tonight's conversation will begin with moderated questions and then open up to questions from the, the audience, usually around 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Because we're in a webinar, there is a separate Q&A section from the chat section. So in the chat room, feel free to share any of the wisdom that you have collected, um, things that you think would be helpful for the community to um, chat about. In the Q&A section, please reserve that for questions you want to lift up to the panelists. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available both on the Facebook event page and at www.justlutheran.com under online trainings and curriculums. If you have registered for this Zoom event, you'll receive a follow-up email after um, today's town hall that will give you both a link to where the video is and to a follow-up survey if you wanna give us any sort of feedback about how we can make our town halls better. You can review any of these logistics in the chat box. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank Pastor Trudy Franzen, who helped to organize today's town hall. And I also want to acknowledge that sharing your voice in a town hall is a leap of faith. At some point, there might be a technology hiccup. Uh, one of my children might come in seeking attention, but let's embrace all of our humanness and the wisdom that we bring into this space. I'm going to begin today with a brief moment of prayer. Please take a moment and bow your hearts as we center ourselves in God. Loving God, when you knit us in our mother's womb, you declared us fabulous and good in all the diverse ways that we would embody life in this world. You breathed breath into our nostrils, you, you pushed sound out of our vocal cords and helped the Holy Spirit to make us unique and loving people. Be with us today, bless our presenters as they share some of their insights into the world. Bless our, our Sierra Pacific Synod and the whole ELCA as we join together, finding ways we can minimize bias and be better at being church together. We ask all of this in the name of your dear son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. And with that, I turn over today's town hall to our moderator, Pastor Bill Wong. Thank you, Megan, and welcome to all to this webinar. I have to admit, this is my first time on a Zoom webinar and first time I've moderated this particular panel. So it's good to be with these folks. And let's begin with, with a word of introduction. And so let's begin with, uh, let's begin with Tina, uh, name, you know, what congregation you, you, you're a member of, uh, other pertinent information. And then after you have finished, Tina, you could invite the next person to share their, uh, to introduce themselves. Okay, uh, my name is Tina, um, uh, born in China, China and raised uh, pretty much in both uh, US and China. I came to US when I was 16 years old I actually married and lived in Vietnam for seven years and returned to U.S. Um, after 2003. So um, I actually started in 2003 attending Lutheran church, various Lutheran church. And in church, I actually find my peace, find my value, and fi uh, found my, um, my, my God. And thanks to the God for that. And... Um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. And um, I joined Grace Lutheran about, I'll say two years ago when um, my son uh, went to college and he's declared LGBTQ as well. So I was actively looking for a church that will more welcome and has no bias or discrimination against LGBTQ. That's how I started with Grace. Mm -hmm. Okay, you get to 
invite the next person to speak. Um, let's invite Pastor Moses Pen Penmaka. Yes. Sorry, if I didn't say it right. <laughs> no, you did. Thank you, Tina. Um, my name is Moses Penumaka. Uh, I came to U.S. Uh, to do my PhD at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and Graduate Theological Union. I am currently on the faculty at the Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary of California Lutheran University. I teach theology and religion. I also direct a um, program we have uh, in ELCA that's called Theological Education for Emerging Ministries, TEAM. Uh, TEAM is um, a great uh, th way of doing theology uh, that has changed the face of theology, not only the face of theology, but even the face of the Lutheran Church in America, ELCA particularly, because through this program, uh, we are able to prepare uh, people of color, Asian American, African American, African national, American Indian, Alaskan natives, and the Latinx. Uh, students coming from these different ethnic groups uh, are part of this program and are able to do theology and serve the church. Um, I am also very glad to be part of this um, session this afternoon because uh, I have the privilege to be part of Asian and Pacific Association of Asian and Pacific Islanders in the LCA. I serve as the vice president of AAPI, Association of Asian and Pacific Islanders, and uh, Reverend Dr. Pong Sok Lim Tong Virat is the director of Asian Pacific Ministries. I will talk more about it uh, in the conversation. And I'm so glad to be part of this conversation and I want to thank the organizers especially Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr and Reverend Trudy Frenzen. I want to invite um, Gail. Thank you, Moses. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Gail Kiyomura. I currently worship at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Oakland. And um, I'm also ser serving currently as your vice president of the Sierra Pacific Synod. Um, my background is pretty much uh, born and raised here in California, actually down in San Jose, California. Um, family's background is actually Buddhist. So I am an adult baptized Lutheran. Um, and how I got into the church was uh, due all the way because of music. Um, I have my bachelor's and master's in music. And when you are a starving music student, you pick up a lot of jobs and those jobs tend to be in churches. And so when I was doing, a, uh, I was a organist slash pianist for a Lutheran church down in San Jose. Um, that's where I got my, my baptism in Lutheranism. And uh, one day the pastor there tapped me on the shoulder and asked me, would you like to be the assisting minister? And I looked at him and I went, me? And he said, yes, you. And I said, okay, you're gonna to have to tell me exactly what I need to do. And he goes, not a problem, we can do that. Um, so that's how I kind of got into the religious side versus just the music side and um, found a, a very warm and welcoming home uh, in that process. So, and here I am today. So there you go. And now it's Stephanie's turn. Okay, thank you, Gail. Stephanie Leong. Um, I, a cradle Lutheran, as Gail pointed out the other day when we were talking. Uh, my mother became a Lutheran because that happened to be the school that was down the street from where they lived in Oakland. Um, we moved a fair amount, not a lot. My dad was a military civilian worker. And so I started out Missouri Synod and then became LCA, Missouri Synod, and then ELCA. And I've been on Synod Council and am currently serving uh, on the Racial and Ethnic Ministries uh, Recycling Team as the head of the Racial Anti-Racism uh, Working Group. And I think, Bill, you're it. I think so. Uh, let's see, Bill Wong. 
born and raised in Los Angeles. Uh, let's see, I was born at what French Hospital in Los Angeles and then grew up in, uh, bounced around in LA County uh, and uh, eventually uh, wound up going to um, what Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and wherever the wind blows, wherever the spirit blows, I go. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve all three expressions of the ELCA congregation, synod and churchwide. So I've bounced all over the place uh, and it's good to be here for this particular meeting. Ah, uh, and I and if, if you haven't noticed yet, we have a nice mix of folks who were American born and also immigrants. And uh, we'd like to just open it up to, to the group here in terms of share a little more about your, you know, being growing up as an American born Asian or coming here a, as an immigrant. And, and how was that experience? What was that experience like, uh, especially being who you are today. So who would like to start in the group at this point? I'll start. Yeah. So um, my, I am actually adopted, which is um, not something that I share a lot, but mm -hmm. it's important, I think, to this conversation because mm -hmm. at the time my parents adopted me because I am Chinese, they could only adopt Chinese children. And that was how it was basically run throughout the US. If you were white, you could adopt any color child you wanted, but if you were black or Native American or Asian, you had to adopt your own, own race. And you had to own your home. And so my father went out with the real estate agent to look at places, and they showed him the places that were underneath the freeway, next to the railroad tracks, and wouldn't show him anything else, basically. And then they found out that there was this plot of land that was being sold, but it came with a racial exclusion. And so through the machinations, my dad worked at the Navy lab up at Hunters Point, and the man who eventually became my godfather bought the land with the racial exclusion clause in it, sold it to my parents' architect without it, and then he sold it to my parents. And so my parents were the first Asians in that town until Willie Mays bought his home. And then I turned out to be the first Asian when we moved back east to Virginia, mm -hmm. outside of Washington, D.C. I was the first Asian that was not white, not black. So I was really the only other thing of, you know, middle, upper middle class kids. I was the first non-black, not in white student there. Um, and I've, you know, I've been pushed, I've been shoved, I've been called chink. Um, things that I just, you know, growing up around here, I never thought I would hear even back there, but here I've gotten it too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that drives the anti-racism mm -hmm. um, part of me the most, probably. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I meant I shared with you guys. I'm reading How to Become an Anti-Racist, so it's a it's a good book so far. Right. Well, you Gail? get. Mm -hmm. I think Stephanie invited you, Gail, to be the next speaker. I was wondering. I thought I heard my name. Um, so uh, again, American born, uh, born in the Bay Area. Um, kind of interesting what Stephanie was telling about her parents and having to buy a home and all that. Um, my story with regards to that similar type of scenario was we had a farm uh, out in San Jose down in, uh, in a 40 acre. We grew strawberries and walnuts. So eventually um, my dad decided to, yes, sell the farm. And so once he sold the farm, we had to move. And so we moved into what would be a basic white neighborhood. Um, and, the, and the reason why for that was uh, my father was interned during World War II. And his main thing for us, my sister and I, would be to assimilate. Um, you have to become part, of the, become part of society because if you don't, you will get cast out. And I, I'm that has to come all the way back to the point that 
it was so easy for the Japanese Americans who were here during World War II to be rounded up and moved inland and away from their homes and their homes, a lot of their property taken away from them. So when we moved, um, my father found a house. Um, I don't know if there were any ethnic res restrictions on it. This is in the mid 60s, early, mid to early 60s. And um, before he bought the home, he walked to every neighbor on the street, knocked on their door and said, would you have any problems with a Japanese family moving in? Because he did not want us to have to deal with racism and bigotry and hate. And so um, he wanted to make sure that and all the neighbors said, no, that's absolutely fine. We welcome you with open arms. So, and this is 1966. So this isn't that long ago. Um, and we found, I, when he told me that story, I was like, you're kidding. He goes, no. He goes, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna put you through what I had to go through. And so with that, you realize the, the roots of racism pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, and like Stephanie growing up, yeah, you get the, you get the Jap, you get the, you know, all the, all the words and you just learn to go, okay, fine. Um, but the best thing that I always laugh at, because it still happens to this date, is um, during work, especially in a work environment, you're talking to people all the time. And even with my surname, Kiyomura, I always get people who will talk to me when they finally see me in person and it comes out of their mouth. My goodness, you do speak really good English. I look at them and I go, and what language do you expect me to speak? I don't say it, but I think that. So it's still there, folks. It's still the vision, the visible, or the what you perceive and you see. It's sometimes tough to get by that, um, but it it exists. And and for those of us who are people of color, um, we just we learn to live with it, which is sad to say, but that is what we have to do. And we learn to go, okay, fine, maybe someday. That question won't be asked because that will be just accepted that of course of course i speak good english so um i'm going to move on to i guess let's go to moses yeah so it's to moses and again it's to share about in this case we've had our two american born and then uh an opportunity to share about your own immigrant experience but also any anything you else you want to share about what it means to be an immigrant asian Thank you, Stephanie and Gail, for sharing your stories. Uh, I came to U.S. to study. I came with my wife uh, and two daughters. Uh, we, when I came here as an ordained pastor from the Lutheran Church, I wanted to find, feel at home in the ELCA, and I wanted to be on the ELCA roster. Um, then at that time, Reverend Bill Wong was uh, in the Synod um, office working with Bishop, um, um, and then he was very supportive, I should acknowledge, he was very supportive of uh, the process for me to be rostered in the LCA, uh, the bishop, of course, but I, it was not a very welcoming uh, environment at that time for pastors of color like me. There was always questions raised to say, um, you know, we don't know where the call will be. What will you do after your PhD? Maybe you should go back to India and, and not think of settling here. But I always wanted to, I felt as a Lutheran, I, ELCA, I belong to ELCA too. So it was, I, not very welcoming. I must say it's, it was very hostile uh, from some of the leadership in uh, the Senate and the ELCA uh, for pastors of color like me. Um, so that was one of uh, my experience. And my two young daughters, uh, they were nine and seven when we came to U.S. They had to really struggle a lot uh, to find out their identity and uh, to discover who they are and see how they are accepted in the U.S. in the in the high school or in in our society, 
as uh, people with the talents and people who work hard, people who are spiritually uh, very deep. Uh, that's what I think I'm proud to be an Asian because um, you know when we think of Asia, Asia is very, very vast, very rich, very complex, but it has so many um, things that I am proud of how uh, Asia Pacific, and I also like Asia um, Pacific uh, region, Oceania as um, thousands of islands of Micronesia, Malonesia, and Polynesia. This belongs to island, com in, in Asia, we have island communities, agricultural communities, diverse and rich cultural heritage, many people, many languages, uh, we give importance to education, dignity of labor. You know why uh, there are so much, so much of industry in Asia is because Asians are very hardworking. We have a good sense of dignity of labor. And um, I Asia has so many people that are made poor uh, because poverty, I don't want to see it as uh, uh, an issue to deal with, but as a political economic issue of injustice the third world most of the asian countries were made poor because of colonization so coming from with that asian identity with the culture with interest in education my daughters really had to struggle a lot in america uh, to 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 claim their identity as human beings as um, as people who have their pr principles and values. So that's what comes to my mind when I quickly think of uh, my story as an, as an immigrant. I'm one of the first immigrants from my family. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to invite, um, um, may I invite Tina? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Tina, you're up and share yes. your story. Thank you, thank you. Um, again, my name is Tina. I was born in China and immigrated to US when I was 16. Um, the first stop I was actually in Oklahoma, uh, which is, uh, it's absolutely no Asian or immigrants that I, I ever interacted with. Uh, being the only family in our high school, um, I felt that um, I wasn't being accepted because uh, first our language is actually a major barrier for us and uh, with only limited English uh, vocabulary or have pretty much no speaking skills, we having a hard time uh, you know, understand what the teacher are talking about even though um, we were actually put in the best maths classes. Like people were just so surprised. Wow, you guys don't speak English, but you're in calculus class. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, it's um, we we actually being there for really short time, short time, about eight months. The only people that willing to talk to us is the the students in our calculus class. Anyone else? It's just pretty much ignoring us because they probably never see an Asian around in, the, in their world. Um, so that's my first experience. Um, and then when I came to San Francisco, uh, pretty much a few months later, um, English still a barrier, but however, the school offers uh, ESL classes, which actually helping us a lot. But still, uh, uh, come, you know, communication is still an issue because when we go home, we still our own, still speak our own language because our parents actually can't even speak a word, uh, a word of English. So um, it, it's kind of like uh, different um, because we have the culture and tradition, different backgrounds. It, it's kind of harder for us to um, being accepted by the other uh, nationalities or native people. And um, many times I, I, I 
embarrassed because my imperfect English and people laughing at me, uh, which actually caused me, you know, being really lack of confidence, especially when I uh, speaking in, uh, for say, making a presentation in classes or attending conference where I would not comfortable to speak up for my own opinions. And I uh, also, you know, kind of avoid going out to join community activities. Um, but it, it, it's, it's just my, my experience, how I being, uh, feel um, like not really being accepted or being uh, uh, kind of different from, from the others. Um, but um, as time change, as I been improving my language skill, hopefully I am better now, um, I was able to speak up for my mind and I was more often to uh, speak in the public, even though attend press conference. Um, it's actually when when there uh, when there um, you know when you feel difference. For for me as an Asian, uh, parents always taught us you have to study hard. You need to improve yourself, and you need to uh, try to make uh, do your best. Even though you might not the best, you might not be the best, but you still have to try your best. So being trying, keep trying, and uh, and then have all those uh, bias, uh, you know, kind of invisible pressure on you. Mm -hmm. So I try to improve myself as much as I can. Uh, but still, um, my husband still correcting me, and my son still correcting me many times when I use the wrong you know, um, grandma and stuff. Um, but uh, I'm thankful that I did not have too much of a bad experience about being uh, discriminating against you. Um, but I, I do see a lot of uh, people around me having bias. Um, you know, I, I feel for their pain. And I really hoping that one day all this can be changed. Mm -hmm. So now I think I'm gonna invite Bill. Oh, thank you, Tina. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, Want to also say to to the rest of the panel. Once I finish, well, what I'm going to say in regards to the my experience of being American born, uh, we'll have a short time where anything else you want to add to that, and then we'll go to the next question. So. Um, Born and raised here in, uh, in Los Angeles, as I said, and of course, uh, being born and raised in Los Angeles, I don't trust air unless I can see it, learn to drive fast, and of course, I cheer for the Dodgers and the Lakers. So I'm a typical American born in that sense. But then simultaneously, uh, I'm expected to be Chinese. Uh, it's interesting growing up with, where my parents are, were, are immigrants, uh, where at dinner time on a regular basis, at least once a week, if not a couple times a week, my father would say to all of us gathered at the dinner table, remember that you're Chinese and be proud of the, the fact that you are Chinese because you have 4,000 years of history and China has never been conquered. And, and he just drilled that into us. And, and that's been one of those things that, that I've held on to. Uh, even in the face of, you know, I would have uh, fellow immigrant students who would remind me that I'm not Chinese enough? Or have you ever heard of the expression banana? Uh, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Or for those of us who speak Cantonese, there's that term juxing, which means hollow bamboo. And, and there were times when I was growing up that I would have elders say to me, because I'm American born, that's who, uh, who you are. Simultaneously, I get asked on the other side, you know, because I know I, I, I will never be white. Wow, you speak good English, Gail, as Gail mentioned. Uh, or, or also, I would get the thing of, you're not American, are you? Or where do you come from? Where were you born? Uh, I would get that. So getting caught in the middle as an American born, uh, and in my case, as a second generation. How American are you? And then, of course, the interesting dynamic is when I talk to my Chinese friends, when they use the word American, you know who they're talking about? They're talking about white folks. They're not talking about us. 
not talking about African Americans, not talking about uh, Mexicans or uh, folks, uh, Latin Amer Latinx, or other folks coming from other countries. Other, you know, the word American means white. Uh, and, and I found that out very early in life. And so here I am caught in the middle. It, it was my experience. And I didn't speak Chinese well enough. And then found out also, though, the first language I learned was Chinese. So my English was bad early on in my life. So being caught in the middle. But thank God, I still love Chinese food. And I continue to be you know, a Chinese American, and, and, I, and I'm proud of that at the same time. But it, it was quite a challenge growing up uh, American and Chinese simultaneously and trying to discover what that meant and holding on to uh, what my father said in terms of, you know, you are Chinese, you have 4,000 years of history, and that's very important. And then the other thing I remember growing up is always being part of the village association gatherings, you know, we'd get together and there was this big mix and all of us would be one big family. So good to, for that. Okay, at this point, other comments, uh, anybody else would like to offer or, or other things that popped into your minds as you've heard other stories here in regards to being American born or immigrant or anything related to that? Okay, the other thing, uh, let me just tie, tie this part of it up is, uh, what we have here are five different stories, rich stories, and really, you know, in one sense, the stories represent a wider story of the Asian American experience. Uh, then, but also want to say to folks, uh, wisdom from one Paul, Pastor Paul Nakamura, who still is the pastor of Oriental Lutheran Church in Torrance. And Paul would say, when you've met one Asian, you've only met one Asian. So keep that in mind as we share our experiences, as we somewhat talk about our respective understanding of the culture, and then we go from there. Um, let's move on then, you know, we are Asians, Asian Americans who are part of the uh, Lutheran Church, and in this case, all of us part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, wanna say one, uh, share, you know, uh, any other thoughts you have about being Lutheran? And then number two, uh, at the, at the uh, second part of the question would be is, how have you experienced bias in the Lutheran church? Let's talk about the, our experience of being Lutherans and, and, and bias uh, at that point. So let's see, I suppose I can go backwards here and start with Tina and then move from there. And then Tina gets to invite the next person, okay? Okay, sure. Uh, my experience with church um, in 2003, that actually was my lowest point of my life. I came back to the state uh, from a, a terrible divorce. Um, a couple of my friends actually attending this church and um, and they actually invited me to attend uh, this Lutheran church. When I, back then, I have no idea what church is about. Uh, didn't even learn anything about Christian or, or Catholic. I, my family background was Buddhism. So I was pretty much like a piece of white paper and starting going to church. And, um, really thankful for this couple friends that they took me there and in church I actually found my peace um i found basically i i i found my god i learned how to forgive and um and um i also uh bringing my 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 child, uh, my back then he was only five years old. Uh, my child was attending the uh, the Sunday school, which is uh, offered by the church as well, and he actually loved that. Um, that's how I started, and uh, I think in around 2010 uh, I was baptized, and uh, 2014 uh, my son, my niece, and my nephew they all baptized the same church. Um, I, 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 did, I did enjoy the church and um, 
mostly the reason is uh, there's a lot of Chinese there. I attended the Chinese service and and um, and my kids, uh, my kids and my nephew and niece, they also like the, their their group and um, uh, and then um, but the only problem I have once I start talking about LGBTQ in my church and as as a lot of Asian or Chinese, uh, probably more like immigrant Chinese, they mainly speak in Cantonese. Um, they're not as they're not adapted to being uh, open or you know open minded accepting. or accepting uh, LGBTQ. And um, I mean, it, it's their culture. They've been taught many years uh, that you know it's the way that a husband and wife supposed to be just. Uh, men and women and uh, there a lot of them they're not uh, easy to adapt to new you know different things um, so in the church I speak Chinese I have Chinese friends and at a point I think okay maybe I should uh, try something else because I having a lot of uh, friends and uh, co-workers they're more open-minded and so I look for a different church, and there I found Grace Lutheran Church uh, with Megan. I feel very comfortable, and I feel very welcomed, and I learn different things in the church. And as I, I feeling that I be more accepted with my, my opinion, or or it's just kind of different. And um, with that. Um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, bias, it's actually the, the thing that kind of I experience in the other church that pushed me out to a different church. But in here, I actually found that it's, you know, people in our church, it's actually understanding and more accept, accepting other, you know, oriented, gender oriented people. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will actually pick on Stephanie. Thank you, Tina. Um, Bill, what were we talking about? I uh, I lost we're, we're talking about being part of the Lutheran Church okay. and, and anything you want to add to your story about becoming a Lutheran and then also uh, experience a bias okay. in the Lutheran Church. So I, as I mentioned, I was born into the Lutheran Church, um, courtesy of my mom, and grew up Missouri Synod, and was more than happy there until we went to the LCA, at which time I think, you know, there was this mental shift, not just because of the fact that we switched synods, but also just at the age I was at in high school. So I think when we came back, I was had problems with the fact that they don't ordain women. They did, weren't even thinking about it at that point, even though the LCA, um, LCA wasn't um, quite there yet anyway. So I, the bias comes in, I think the same as all of you have talked about where even within the church, I've had people come up and say, where did you learn to speak English? Um, you know, and it's like the same place you did, you know, in school. And you don't get that question that much anymore, but it's still, I think, presumed that you are going to be good in math versus necessarily good in English, even that, you know, I, when somebody says something about how I write or I speak, it's sort of like, well, I was an English major, you know, hopefully I can write well um and just these things that people don't even think about they don't think before they talk it's just almost like you're presenting them with something that's so different and yet in this day and age it shouldn't be different even within the church you know why 
don't, you know, if your neighborhood has a large Asian population, why aren't those people coming to your church? What are you doing that is pushing them away or not making them feel welcome when they walk in? And is it because you do everything the same way that the church that was built a hundred years ago, still, you're still doing the same things? You know, um, I like the fact that we have a smorgasbord every December with the Santa Lucia Festival, um, and we've changed it into an international smorgasbord, but it's still a smorgasbord, which I happen to like, but um, it's a variety of things there, but we still do this service in Swedish, which, you know, attack links back, and it's, but the, it's the only thing. But the problem is, is that we don't do anything that, that is special for any other culture that might be within that church. And I don't think that's any different than a lot of other churches either. So, Moses? Moses. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'd like to address it uh, from my uh, background. I grew up in India. Um, you know, we were... Hindus before we became Christians. We converted into Christianity, our forefathers. So I look at myself as an Indian Hindu converted to Christianity, a partly Dalit, a heterosexual Dravidian ethnicity. Uh, so with that, um, I, I must acknowledge uh, in India as a belonging to Protestant church, Lutheran church, a uh, Luther, was respected well. Luther's theology, especially theology of the cross, made a lot of sense to the people in the margins, especially in India, in Hindu culture, those uh, of our communities that are pushed to the margins, um, being well invited to the church uh, as to receive the body and blood of Christ. That was very powerful. So a lot of marginalized people from the Dalit background embrace Christianity, uh, gospel brought by the Lutheran missionary. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, but coming to U.S. to study theology, uh, it was always like you have, to, um, you have to be very fluent in Luther, what Luther said. Not my Hindu tradition and not a, the Hindu inter-religious um, or interfaith uh, upbringing I had, that was not really welcomed for a long time in our church. Only when you speak like Lutherans, um, you know, once when I was preaching with uh, quoting Luther and all that, one person came and said, oh, you speak like a Norwegian. <laughs> so be, only to be accepted, you have to be fluent with Lutheran theology Lutheran, what Luther said. And for a long time, uh, I must say, in my experience, the LCA hasn't really been welcoming to the spiritualities that we brought from Asia. Um, now, I'm glad we, the LCA has a declaration on uh, interreligious dialogue. Uh, we have so many documents that can be resources. We can address that. Uh, but for a long time, anything other than Lutheran was seen with hostility and not welcomed. So I really had to, uh, used to feel like a voice in the wilderness when I want to talk about the diversity that we celebrated in Asian context, in Indian uh, theological context. So um, I, I must say it was, um, it was, uh, against the grain, uh, swimming against uh, the, the stream to be recognized as an Asian Lutheran uh, with the spirituality, religiosity that is formed in a multi-faith context um, in, India, in India where I grew up. And also the theological studies where, which I did um, before coming here in Bangalore. So uh, that has been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I want to invite um, Gail. Thank you, Moses. 
Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm actually kind of reading some of the questions in the chart, so sorry, in the chat box. So uh, my apologies, I'm multi, trying to multitask and I don't think I'm doing a very good job. Um, so I guess it's a two part question, so I am going to uh, tackle the Lutheran part of it. And um, I think once I started to get more involved with the Lutheran Church, the thing that always, and it still strikes me today, is that we are all saved by grace. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what's funny is that in my work environment, when things get to be crazy and people, you can tell tensions are rising and people are not happy, um, I usually gather those in the room and I just say, everyone, we need to take a moment and just allow grace. We need to have a moment of grace here because if we don't, we're all going to just kill each other. So um, it, it is one of those foundations that in my life is very important that we always remember that, you know, we're saved by grace. And so long as we remember that, we can always go forward and do what we, we can get things done. We can accomplish so much more and know that, you know, God and grace are, are behind us all the time. So that's the Lutheran side of me. Um, the bias is interesting because um, I, I think, especially within the Japanese American society, and again, I go back to World War II, um, that was significant in, in our society. Um, to, be, to be called out, to be told you are the other and you are the enemy and therefore um, to protect everyone else, all the, all the white people, we must take you and move you from your home and move you far away um, because of the fear. And what I always found interesting was um, the perception that was of my family, especially the older, the older adults in the family was, well, you know, they were doing that for our protection. I went, really? Okay. Um, that was their perception, and, and, that, and it was fed to them that we're doing this because we want to protect you, um, which maybe had a little bit of truth to it. I mean, people were getting beat up, but you know, it's the idea that um, don't you know we're not doing this because you're different. We're doing this because we're protecting you, and and I always thought that was an, an interesting concept um, because they didn't you know if you rocked the boat, you were hauled away to jail. So now speed that up to today and. Um, you know, you look at those of us of uh, the, you know, the Asian uh, persuasion, so to speak, um, bananas or fresh off the boat or whatever term you want to use um, with the, with the whole thing with the coronavirus and how, again, being Asian, people look at you a little differently. Um, we are lucky, I'll say that, we're lucky here to live, especially I live in the Bay Area, where you don't get that sense. But it doesn't take much to go beyond the Bay Area, go into the Central Valley, go into northern parts of California, and it, it does get different. And um, you get the look, you get the, hmm, and no one's going to come up and say anything to you usually, but you know that they're looking at you going, are you here or did you just come from, you know, Asia somewhere? And you're like, mm, okay, fine. We'll just leave it as that. Um, so the bias is interesting. I think the bias in the church, um, probably the biggest thing that I always find interesting when we are trying to figure out how to bring in ethnicities is um, the knee-jerk reaction of, well, let's just do this type of service because if we do a Hispanic service, We'll be able to draw in, you know, all the Hispanic or Latinx people in the area, or let's do a gospel service, and that way we'll bring in all the African American and Black. And it's like, okay, first of all, that's disingenuous, and second of all, do your homework, because that is not necessarily how you're going to get people in. You can get people in by being who you are and being welcoming and being um, honest and being um, understanding and just being yourself. And that usually will come through more than anything else, more than trying to say, oh, look at us, we can do all these different ethnic cultural things in our church. And it's like, you know, let the church speak for yourself, let your congregation speak for itself. And if you're honest, people will see that. And I think Tina was talking about that too, when she went to Grace, 
that was an honest reaction. She got there and she enjoyed and she stayed because of the congregation, not because it's a fully Chinese congregation, it's not a fully Japanese, whatever you want to call it, it's the people that make up the congregation. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, I suppose it's my turn, right? <laughs> uh, I became a Lutheran uh, through what? St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Monterey Park, California. And uh, it just so happens that in Monterey Park, there was a growing Chinese population, as it also turns out also a, a growing, uh, what, second generation Japanese population. And uh, there was a uh, housing tracks in Monterey Park, Monterey, known as Monterey Hills and Monterey Highlands, where a number of Asians, mostly of Japanese and Chinese background, uh, moved in there. So the decision was made by the Lutheran Church in America way back in 19, in the mid 1960s to start a Chinese uh, Lutheran congregate or ministry and a pre-existing congregation, in this case, St. Paul's. And St. Paul's offered what, a Chinese language school and the pastor was one, uh, Pastor Wilson Wu was called to be the assistant pastor. And uh, the uh, and he decided to start a Chinese language school to reach out. And my parents, being good Chinese parents, decided that their children will learn Chinese. So we went there. And then uh, Pastor Wu told a little white lie that said, to go to this Chinese language school, your children have to go to Sunday school. So my parents, along with other parents, with a focus on education, said, sure. So that's how I... Uh, became a part of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Monterey Park. Um, and uh, the, the other reason why I eventually I, I would join St. Paul's is St. Paul's had a what junior high Luther League, a youth group, and they invited me to be part of that youth group. One thing led to another, and there I became a Lutheran. Now, the other interesting dynamic in terms of this being the first Chinese ministry, the first Asian ministry in the Lutheran Church in America, was the fact that they called Wilson Wu. The, the funny part about this, and I, and I get to joke about this, is the fact that Wilson Wu is from northern China and, uh, and wound up in Taiwan. And Wilson's first language is Mandarin. All the Chinese residing in Monterey Hills and Monterey Park at the time were from southern China and spoke Cantonese. And the funny part about this is that Wilson had to preach in English to a group of Chinese. Anyway, how's that for a Lutheran story in terms of not understanding Asians? Um, let's see, in terms of experiencing bi uh, bias in the Lutheran church, um, where the bias showed up for me very strongly was in seminary. Uh, it was the first time that I really felt like I did not fit in was in seminary. Uh, the first time I ever heard of any Sven and Oli jokes uh, or any of the Lutheran uh, uh, ethnic jokes. First time I learned of the ethnic history of the Lutheran church, discovered how white uh, the Lutheran church was or is. Uh, and one of my classmates, one of my classmates actually said to me, Bill, I don't see you as being Chinese. I just see you as a person. And you know, that just stabbed me in the heart, you know, because my father taught me 4,000 years of Chinese history, you're Chinese. And he could not accept that as a part of me, a central part of who I am. A classmate of mine, a fellow Lutheran seminarian classmate, and then the other thing I discovered was, you know, I, I was interested at the time in doing what Chinese ministries or willing to explore the possibility, but there wasn't anybody on campus at the time uh, or anybody that, that could help me to explore that. And, and it became one, something that I had to look into as opposed to the church being open and ready to have me, a Chinese American, willing to do Chinese ministries at the time. I was very fortunate uh, while I was thinking about maybe leaving seminary because I didn't quite fit in during the second semester of my time at P Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Um, the Division for Mission in North America of the Lutheran Church in America brought on board a, a consultant for Asian ministries named uh, Dr. Edmund Yee. 
And as part of his responsibilities for the Division for Mission in North America and the Lutheran Church in America was that he would be on the, uh, an adjunct faculty at Pacific Lutheran, uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary. So, and as soon as he came on board, I said, wow, I have someone I can talk to and I can relate to. And one of the words of advice, I, I remember I, I had dinner. He invited, Dr. Yi invited me for dinner. And Dr. Yi said to me, you know, Bill, one of the things you got to watch out for is don't let this church bleach you. You understand? Do not let this church bleach you. And then at which point uh, Edmund Yee shared with me that that's what happened to him. And he regretted that. And he wanted to pass that wisdom on to me. And to this day, you know, I am very thankful that Dr. Yee, by the grace of God, appeared at the right time in the right place and kept me going. And it reminds me back to, you know, as Gail says, it's grace. You know, God provides in the midst of these kinds of things. So I'm thankful. So anyway, uh, so uh, it's, it's really tough sledding at times. So, hey, any other comments uh, the, 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 the other panelists have now that you've heard the, some the, the other stories? Anything else you want to add in terms of being Lutheran or bias in the Lutheran church? Any, anything else that you, you would like to add to that experience? Going once, going twice. Ready to offer suggestions to the wider audience in terms of how to tackle bias or racism or uh, prejudice, discrimination? Ready for that? Okay. Yes, yes uh, Mo. I would like to uh, talk about two things. One, there's always a question about how the Lutheran Church can be better. Mm -hmm. uh, I am glad that question uh, should always be there. And because of that question, maybe there are some positive developments in ELCA. Sure. I, I am glad to be part of ELCA because of its um, um, being trying to be alive addressing all these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them so pertinent, so important and imperative, you know, they, they're inevitable also. We have to survive. If you want to be alive and uh, survive, mm -hmm. we have to respond to this. So I am glad ELC is doing a lot of uh, work. Um, to this question of how, um, what have you seen congregations um, do that has been helpful to decrease bias? I would say, recognizing and acknowledging with the mutual respect. I want to stress this with mutual respect, uh, the diversity in our churches. Mm -hmm. The churches have to recognize and acknowledge the diversity. As uh, you were saying, Bill, um, we always say, oh, I see you as a human being. I don't see you with of what, who you are as a Chinese or Asian, but that is problematic because mm -hmm. as you said, um, how it was um, painful to, to recognize and acknowledge diversity with mutual respect, uh, celebrating diversity. Some of the churches are trying to do that, but more to be done. Now, I think what is being done is very limited, very, uh, sometimes it looks like tokenism. It's not, but of course, it looks like that because it's very small percentage of churches are embracing diversity, acknowledging and celebrating it, but more has to be done. Mm -hmm. And I want to say one of the resources uh, that um, I had the privilege to be part of, I see Reverend Priscilla being part of the, the webinar this afternoon. And some of us, um, for the first time in the LCA, uh, completely um, people of color, leaders, pastors, lay leaders, scholars of color came together and we put together how strategic and authentic is our diversity, a call for confession, reflection, and healing action. This document talks about how churches can change, how seminaries can change, how candidacy committees can change, because sometimes candidacy committees are the ones who help uh, prepare leadership for this church. And oftentimes, because uh, the church, even though willing, sometimes do not know how to handle, 
a um, lot of mistakes are done and people of color, Asians or other, our siblings have been discriminated um, through bias, through, um, through uh, prejudice. So this document that I'm talking about, I requested Dr. Mo Megan uh, wrote to put this on the web for people to download. How strategic and authentic is our diversity? A call for confession, reflection, and healing action. This document provides concrete examples. Some of the actions that uh, can be done in congregations, at the synod level, in the theological education seminaries, and at the church wide. So I want to encourage you to look at this document and see how your congregation and how you as individuals can uh, make use of these resources and make a change in your own context. Mm -hmm. okay. Moses, you Tina want to invite someone else to speak? Yes, uh, Tina. Okay. Uh I'm sorry, what, what is this about? Do you, you want us to talk to? Oh, uh, suggestions or recommendations in regards to changing the, the, the church or to, uh, uh, yeah, suggestions, recommendations. Decrease bias. Yeah. I, I, I would say a suggestion that it's, you know, it's general speaking church. Mm -hmm. um, being the fact that I was more involved with the Chinese uh, congregation back then, um, I can see um, many, many people actually, they're not really accepting mm -hmm. uh, new, new things like new ideas or, or um, I would say education is one of the main thing that I will point it out because um, mm -hmm. um, being nowadays more, especially more um, gender identity that we can see around us, that it's uh, for certain people, they still not open up. Um, just for myself, my family, we do have family member that at an extreme that really didn't like certain things that we, on the other end, we think it's perfectly fine. Um, also, I was thinking that uh, how to how to help people to be open-minded um, for them to get more in, involved uh, with different group of people. Uh, for for example, that you know, I at the way that I love Grace, we have people actually. We're accepting everybody else's, who, who they really are, not to judge and to just, you know, to criticize them, um, which I think that it's uh, not all the, the, all churches are doing that, or, or I won't say church, but many other congregations probably don't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to, ex to able to uh, see other. Uh, people. Okay. You get to invite the next person. I can invite Gail. Gail. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer the question only because I'm, I have something in my mind and I don't know if it answers the question or not. But I think one of the things that um, we can do to help maybe I don't know if it's cut down the bias or we get more diversity, is within your congregations, um, make sure your leadership, you involve those of diverse background in your leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that means, you know, the current council president or someone, or the, even the pastor needs to go up and tap someone on the shoulder and say, would you be willing to serve as president of council or the treasurer or, you know, head up the worship and music committee or whatever it is. Um, because part of that is um, being asked. And sometimes if you are a minority, um, you're not necessarily always asked. You're always kind of, you watch everyone else kind of get 
stuff done and you're sitting there going, well, what about me? And depending on how you're raised, that's not something you're going to do automatically. You're not automatically going to put yourself forward or what your background is. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to be as leaders within your own congregations, you have to be a little more visual or um, not visual, visionary and look at what you have in your congregations and say, I think it would be really good because we need that perspective. And in the broader spectrum, in the world of, in, in corporate world and all, you know, in the business world, that is a key thing that they're trying to do. They're trying to build diversity within their own business world, within boards, within um, groups, is that if you only have, as we, as I lovingly call it, male, pale, and stale, that's where it's going to stay. So unless you are forward thinking and say, I'm going to purposely go and find and ask because you want that perspective into your group think, that's what you have to do. And sometimes it's, it's easier just to go to the person that you're going to say, oh, they'll, they'll do it. I know they'll do it if I ask them. Well, don't ask that person. Ask the other person. And you might have to work on that other person for a little bit. But the thing is, is that maybe once they say yes, you're going to get some, you're going to get an idea. You're going to get a vision that maybe you hadn't seen before. So that's, that's my speech. Um, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I think sort of linking on what you were saying, Gail, is also to have pastors and deans really reach out to those members of their congregations, Asian, Black, Latinx, whatever, and encourage them to participate in the wider synod groups, synod council, discipling teams, whatever is out there. Um, you need diversity there too in order for everything to be working out. It can't just just be within a congregation. Um, and I think the biggest example of this is, you know, other than the positions at large, the three um, conferences or districts that are male are all white male. Yeah, and I think that's that's my thing is that, you know, I think the Senate as a whole needs to figure out how to raise up those that aren't white male. And I think that's about all I have to say on it. Bill, next question, or are we on to the Q&A? Almost, uh, I'll toss in my thoughts in regards to uh, an adjustment or a change in the ELCA or really for congregations as a whole. Uh, one of the things that uh, I really hold dear is uh, a text from uh, what Paul, uh, chapter nine in uh, what First Corinthians, he, he talks about his approach about reaching out to people. And, and one of the things he, he talks about is the fact that he's willing to become all things to all people that he may save some. And I always found that an interesting approach because I, I don't think we practice that as much as we ought to in my opinion. In other words, Paul would say, well, if I'm going to reach out to a Gentile, I'm going to become a Gentile, which is really uh, uh, an odd observation on Paul's part because he's a Jew and he's a Pharisee in background. But that's what he did. I mean, he wanted to be like closer to the other person and be the other person. Or the other way of looking at it is, you know, on Pentecost, the assumption happens to be is that when the Holy Spirit gives all these uh, Jews uh, this opportunity to speak in other languages. Did you notice that at no point was the conversation ever shifted to saying, so what one language are we going to say? Or is everybody going to speak Hebrew? Is everybody going to speak Latin or speak Greek? No. It was assumed that all of us are going to be like Christ, and all of us are going to be followers of Jesus Christ. And so the, the, there was not this thought about one predominates over another, and no sense of folks becoming like us we're in this together and, and, and i think w w you know there's a particular approach that we w we usually take in congregations and, and that is well we want people to join and become like us i'm of the opinion that what the church needs is to reach out to other people and be become more like the people we want to connect with because 
I know that there's a whole bunch of folks that might consider being the church, but what, what is it that the church is asking me to do? They, they're not welcoming me to be me. We're welcoming them to be like us. And I think that's not the approach that we need to be taking now because the other dynamic that happens when we say to folks, you have to become like us, is that we have a thing called power. And we get to force people to become like us if you want to join this congregation. And if we are a church of grace, should we not be gracious to the people who want to be a part of the congregation as opposed to it? to exercising law that they have to be like us. I think that's the, 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 that's where I think a congregation gets wrong sighted or the congregation, rather than trying to establish authentic relationships with this other group of folks, wants them to become like us and it's not a real relationship that we have with them. So why would I wanna join a congregation that doesn't welcome me for who I am and wants me to be a part and then if we want authentic relationship, then it becomes a mutual kind of thing where we get to be in relationship together and be one together. So that's my thought for the moment among many others. I think we're moving into this time of questions. So I wanna end this time that we have together uh, with a poem titled, What Are You? by Joanne Miyamoto. Uh, have any of you ever heard this poem by Joanne Miyamoto? Okay. Uh, it, it was. It was done way back in a time known as 1971, but I think it still applies today. When I was young, kids used to ask me, what are you? I tell them what my mom told me, I'm an American. Chin Chin Chinaman, you're a Jap. Flashing hot inside, I'd go home. My mom would say, don't worry, he who walks alone walks faster. People kept asking me, what are you? And I would always answer, I'm an American. They say, no, 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 what nationality? I'm an American. That's where I was born, flashing hot inside. And when I tell them what they wanted to know, Japanese, oh, I've been to Japan. I get it over with. Me, they could catalog and file me, pigeonhole me, so they'd know just how to think of me priding themselves, they can guess the difference between Japanese and Chinese. They had me wishing I was American, just like them. They had me wishing I was what I'd been seeing in movies and on TV, on billboards and in magazines, and I tried. While they were making laws in California against us owning land, we were trying to be American. And laws against us intermarrying with white people, we were trying to be American. And when they put us in concentration camps, we were trying to be American. Our people volunteered to fight against their own country, trying to be American. When they dropped the atom bomb, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we were still trying. Finally, we made it. Most of our parents fiercely dedicated to give us a good education, to give us everything they never had, we made it. Now they use us as an example to the blacks and browns, how we made it, how we overcame. But there was always someone asking me, what are you? Now I answer, I'm an Asian. And they say, why do you want to separate yourselves? Now I say, I'm Japanese. And they say, don't you know this is the greatest country in the world? Now I say in America, I'm part of the third world people. And they say, if you don't like it here, why don't you go back? Well, Megan, it's <laughs> all right. Well, we have we have a couple of uh, questions from those who have been watching. Um, some made it to the Q and A section. Some are from other places. Okay. Uh, the one that I thought we would begin with is um, we can modify it based on your different contexts. Mm -hmm. But the the question is, how are things similar or different from when you were growing up? than how they are for your children or grandchildren. Um, and if you don't have children or grandchildren, maybe think about like kids these days, like how, how is life, how is it different when you were growing up than, than how you see it being for kids these days? And I'm an, I'll invite Moses to go first. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rohr. Uh, these are, 
very strange days. You know, today, uh, de dealing with pandemic, dealing with racial injustice, uh, prejudice, uh, you know, all of that we have to deal with. Um, my children are navigating um, their lives um, and I, it, it's they. They think very fast. They have. They are part of the social networks. They are well read, well informed, uh, but they really struggle um, with all that is going on uh, in today's context, especially with racial injustice um, and the inequality that um, comes across uh, in all in all levels of life. Uh, not only the church, but in our nation. So, um, I, 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 I need to have more conversation with my children, but when I, the few conversations I have, I see some hope, you know, they embrace the world uh, through a different uh, experience than how we were conditioned. You know, um, somebody mentioned about, um, model minority complex or we, are, we always have to prove ourselves from that to, to acknowledging people as they are respecting the other um, thinking of inclusion equity all of that is what my children um, are developing so i see hope uh, when i look at this present generation that want to cross barriers and embrace uh, the other with respect. Do you have any thoughts on that, Gail? Um, I have two kids. They're young adults, actually, 25 and 23. Um, they are, um, we lovingly call them the Hapahalis. They are uh, <laughs> half Japanese and half Caucasian, so they are Hapahali. And um, they have basically two, they have one foot in one culture, so to speak, and one foot in another culture. Mm -hmm. And so um, they have been raised with the idea that um, they have a cultural background in, in Japan and Japanese, and they also have their cultural background from their father, which is, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And I think they've been able to, um, you know, they've been able to do that well. Um, I, I, to be perfectly honest, their, high, their growing up years, um, there were very many growing up with them that were of Asian background. I would say probably predominantly that was the, the largest ethnicity of, of their school, school friends. Um, I am amused that my daughter's two best friends are Asian. One's Korean and one's Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and my son is dating a Chinese young lady. So I, I'm amused watching this going, okay, you know, but that, that's obviously that they're, that's what they are comfortable with. Those are their friends. And um, I think they're, they're navigating it pretty well. Um, I know that one time we talked to them about the fact that um, my husband and I would have, our marriage would have been illegal mm -hmm. in many parts of the United States until 19, I want to say 1967 or somewhere around there around was there. when the, was when that whole idea of interracial marriage was acceptable, you know, legally acceptable. So uh, I think for them, they were shocked that that was on the books. And I go, oh no, it, it was. And that um, they realized that there's still a lot of things to learn about being, understanding how this country is. And obviously the Black Lives Matter movement has made a huge, huge uh, effect on them too, because they realize that um, they do have an ethnic background and, and that there's nothing that they should they should enjoy having that ethnic background and make sure that no one ever feels a second class citizen because of being of a, of a different race or different uh, ethnicity or even LGBTQ that, that, that doesn't apply in their lifetime or it shouldn't apply in their lifetime. 
Tina, do you have any thoughts about how things might be different for your children? Yes, I, I was say when we were a kid, we were always listening to your parents and they would tell you what to do, what to think, how to move, how to deal with things. And nowadays it's just kids, they, they think they're, well, they, because they're more uh, access to the in internet, um, they were able to find answers like in a different way than what we did, what we have in the past. Um, they're, they're, they're thinking very independently. However, I think nowadays the children that they do not have the spiritual life, um, they do socialize with their friends, but it, it's just different. They, um, uh, I would say they, they don't, they, um, like, like for example, my, uh, my own child, 21 years old, um, he's pretty grow up in 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 there with me, which I'm more open to uh, accept various. Uh, you know, I, I I will say that I'm more open minded. Uh, same thing as my uh, my my niece and nephew. They grow up with their parents, which their parents are very traditional. Um, they they're not you know they they pretty much been. Uh, protected and being shaded in a certain way that they were only allowed to grow to different, you know, with a different shape and style. Whereas my son, he actually able to explore to more different uh, area and, and he will be more independent on the way that he was thinking uh, and also uh, accepting who will be more open-minded. Um, but I mean, what I see now with they, the kids, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just, uh, they're more, uh, uh, I would say from my own experience, they're more, more willing to speak for their mind uh, than when we were, when I was a, a kid that we're, basically not allowed to say any, basically not allowed to tell, uh, express our, our idea, our opinion, mm -hmm. when this day is the kids just basically they're freely, they have the freedom or, or sometimes I can, I would say that privilege uh, to freely speak out the mind. Sometimes that uh, it's actually not really a, you know, sometimes they, they probably a little bit more, I would say more self-centered instead of being more considerate to other people's, uh, their feelings or, you know, some, some could be, uh, you know, not, not as, I'll say some, some could be, you know, uh, a negative. Stephanie, do you have any thoughts? I actually have stepchildren, um, not children of my own, so I'm not around them. And I'm going to just say from the congregation, I don't, I grew up with the, I had to go to church every single Sunday because my parents dragged me whether I wanted to or not. And um, I just don't see as many kids in the church, which makes it it's sort of this sort of spiraling down words because the fewer kids that are in a church, the harder it is for those kids that are there to make those connections that keep them coming back. Mm -hmm. And um, I know for us, we've seen a transition of a number of families to other Christian churches and Lutheran churches in the area that have more kids. Um, in that respect, I'm thankful that the parents aren't just leaving the church as a whole, um, but I'm sorry that they are leaving our church in particular. Um, and my stepkids have no, no religious upbringing at all, and that is because their mother, is, who is the basic one that brought them up, has is antithetical to Christianity. and. 
they only ever run into it when they come to visit us, which is very few and far between or when we go there. So, which isn't going to be for a long while since they're in Georgia and Pennsylvania. So that's about it for me. How about you, Bill? Well, I have two daughters uh, and, and my wife is uh, what Swedish in background. So they're quote unquote biracial. Um, and one of the things that my wife and I agreed that when we raised our daughters, we would remind them that they are Chinese Swedes uh, just to give them grounding because the, the one thing that happens, especially for uh, Asians, uh, because we, we have such a strong immigrant background, it, it, there's a process in the United States known as assimilation. And assimilation really is uh, I'll use the word back to what Edmund Yee taught me or advised me. It, it's a bleaching process. It, it takes that away and, and wanted to ground our daughters in terms of understanding who they are, whose they are, because then we took them to church and, and remind them that, the, you know, ho however you want to identify, remember you have a grounding. Uh, and, and then the, the interesting dynamic is that on a regular basis, both of them get asked on a regular basis, who are you? What are you? Uh, are you, uh, you, you look different, uh, and people are trying to classify them on a regular basis. Uh, gee, you, uh, are you, so they've been, what, considered Latinx, uh, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, or any number of any other groups, uh, and, and both of them ha have had to argue with the reality that, uh, no, they're, 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 they're Asian in background, or in this case, Chinese, and they're Chinese Swedes. As a matter of fact, my eldest daughter went to California Lutheran University, and one of the members of the faculty walked up to uh, my daughter, and there was, a, in this case, a blonde female walking next to her. And he, he asked the blonde female, are you Swedish? Because he wanted to highlight the upcoming Scandinavian festival at California Lutheran University. And, and the blonde lady says, no, I'm not. I happen to be English. Scottish in background. And then my daughter Katrina then said to him, well, I'm Swedish in background. And he, he was taken aback by that. But I, I, I think that's, uh, um, you know, I, I don't think things are that different than when I was growing up uh, in terms of being there. And of course, when it comes to family dynamics, you know, uh, since my mother is still alive, you know, she gauges all her grandchildren by how Chinese they are. So, and there's an expectation that they will, they understand what it means to be Chinese when they visit my mother's home. So they're pushed back and forth. And as a matter of fact, one of my youngest daughter's best friends says, no, you're not Chinese. Even though my daughter tells her constantly that she is Chinese in background. So it's still out there. And, uh, and those of us who are who we are have to be real strong to work against the assimilation process, or at least decide how assimilated do we want to be and, and, and have agency in terms of determining our identity and remind folks that it is we who, who uh, what, decide who we are, not them, not those in power, not the folks who think they have the privilege of identifying us or classifying us or telling us who we are. So, and I thank God my daughters are strong. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm incredibly grateful that you all have shared your time with us and, and shared your stories with us. I, I leave every single one of these town halls feeling like, see, this is where we need to put our focus. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you have again uh, readjusted my barometer to think about ways that we can more fully care for diversity. Next Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time, we'll be listening to diverse uh, folk who have very differing body size and different relationships with food and eating. And you can mm -hmm. imagine how that might influence their way of being in the Lutheran church. Uh, so mm -hmm. I invite you to, to join us for that panel led by Pastor Amanda Trajinsky. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Bill, would you be willing to close us in prayer to end us out today? Sure, sure. Thank you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we offer you thanks and praise for this opportunity to be together, to experience this webinar, to know indeed that every one of us is a child of God, 
Every one of us is held precious in your heart. That every one of us is in your good hands and all of us, all of us, because we are your children. We are all equal and we all have a variety of gifts. So we offer thanksgiving to you for the beauty of this creation and that you, we have been created in your image. So we thank you for that. And as we go forth from this place, also, you know, we thank you for this time together that it has hopefully empowered us and reminded us that not only are we your children, but that we are your ministers and that we are this leaven that goes out to transform this world so that it can be your presence so that you will shine so that we can share that grace so that others may know you through us and we may see you in them. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Take care. Thank awesome. you, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. You guys are really great.